Uh, name is Arnold Altaffer, and I uh, came from Moorcroft, Wyoming, born and raised, graduated there, and uh, was drafted there in the middle of 67, and uh, was in Vietnam almost exactly the year of 1968, went over there about the second or third and got back on New Year's Eve, so I was right there in 68. Uh, and then I had a career in uh, with Farm Credit Services and retired here about two and a half years ago and moved back up to Moorcroft. We got a little place up there, so. Nice. I really like it up there. Yeah, it's kind of pretty. Um, kind so, of wet right now. Yeah. What unit were you with, sir? Uh, I was in the 1st Infantry Division, Alpha Company, 2nd to 16th, and it was totally infantry. I mean, we didn't, I pro didn't have any other thing but walking power up there. <laughs> and I was just telling the guy I was talking to, I probably spent uh, 11 months in the bush. I didn't, you know, we had a little time in Zeon, our base camp, and a little time on R&R, &R, but uh, probably spent 11 months actually in the bush, in an NDP, some of it, but I mean, we, we did not we didn't, we didn't have beds or had leeches to lay on sometimes. But. Um, so what, what would you say would be one of the most memorable events that sticks, sticks in your mind? Well, probably one of the most eventful, I suppose, and memorable is, the, is actually the Tet Offensive. Uh, the, the company had gotten probably a little complacent, hadn't seen a lot of action. And people were a little careless, in my opinion, weren't paying a lot of attention as they should have. And uh, the morning of the Tet Offensive, we got, I was on outpost and happened to make contact with some people that I didn't like. And uh, it it really opened my eyes up and the rest of the world that, that we're in a real war. I mean, there just people dead. And, and I was part of that, you know, helping do that. And uh, it, it really woke everybody up. And, and my instinct is, or my old country boy, I don't know if it's instinct or not, it's probably what saved me through that first hours of Tet is uh, we were on outpost writing letters, me and another kid, but I always kept my M16 right here. <laughs> It wasn't over there parked on the tree or laying over there. I always kept it right here. And uh, that probably was the only reason I'm here today. And then people kind of learned to do that later on, that, hey, this is a bad deal. And uh, But I didn't develop any bad habits, uh, I don't think, and had a pretty quick learning curve, and it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. So that uh that certainly sticks out in my mind and then uh, some of the events that followed that we lost quite a few people as a result of that but uh, that's a whole different story <laughs> um how do you feel about the event that the states put on today sir and this this event how do you feel like um especially the veterans you know how do you feel like they're going to react to that or how do you personally feel about that i really uh, very much appreciated it. I, I really don't understand uh, how it was all funded, whether the state of Wyoming or whether it was all volunteer, I don't know, but I really appreciate it and there's a lot of volunteers here that it's hard to thank everybody for what they've done and the meals and everything. I, it, It's very nice. I, I probably lucked out a little bit when I came home. Uh, like say I got to Oakland and San Francisco on New Year's Eve and uh, there was nothing going on in an airport New Year's Eve so I didn't have any protesters or <laughs> it was just there and and uh, so I didn't you know I didn't feel a sting I guess that maybe some did so and I personally don't spend a lot of time dealing with that I mean I move on and got back and went to college and kept going I didn't let stuff like that bother me and so but but there wasn't a lot of protest when I got back to the community up there you know everybody was happy to see me so it was 
what the, what I read in the paper and heard uh, on you know TV and stuff is I didn't ever experience that about the the, the you know getting spit on and all that stuff. So I I miss that. That's a good. I don't deal with that very well, so yeah. it's probably, it probably be best that I missed it. Yeah. Um, is there something that you'd like to say? Anything else you'd like to say? Um, this is all about you, really. So I guess one of the things that we've had a lot of people talk about is um, opening up, you know, and... Um, have you had any sort of trouble with that, or is that something that you practice or try doing? To I have not had a problem with it. I don't believe early on. I, you know, maybe didn't talk about it a whole lot. But uh, like when I was here in Casper, I used to show slides to, you know, the school kids and stuff like that. I mean, I, I didn't mind discussing it. Uh, so I don't know. I guess I really didn't have any problem. It was a little tough, frankly, early on. Uh, I was out about uh, two or three months, and uh, then I started to school uh, college in Laramie. And there was some stuff going on on campus, and sometimes in the classrooms. And I was probably a little more belligerent than I should have been, but it kind of worked, it quieted down, and so. Uh, but I. You know, I didn't get in any conflicts with people. I don't think too too bad. So, and I know that's not the question you ask, but yeah, I don't I don't mind telling stories. People want to know what happened to me, and it's such a tiny, tiny piece of what really went on in Vietnam. There's, uh, you know, you, all the different branches, but the things everybody did, and what one person did is such a small little microcosm that. Uh, People have to, and me have to keep that in mind when you're talking about it because there's a big, big war going on over there, and I was a little bitty piece of it. So, Adrian, I have one question. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, you'd said that um, <clears throat> that you were a quick learner, but that it was one of the better or best things that ever happened to you. What did you mean by that? That I uh, I never lost my vigilance. Uh, I mean, I I learned real quick that this is a real war, and. I walked, actually, as a squad leader, et cetera, I walked point for like nine months because I thought that I was more vigilant and more aware than anybody else, and I kind of took it upon myself to do that. And it kind of boils back to that. I mean, you, you do learn pretty quick, uh, like a few minutes, and, and you you realize that it's a, it's a real deal. When you start seeing bodies come out, you realize real quick that it's a real deal and I never lost that. When you're on when you're on point, how do you ever rest? Uh, that's it right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough question because uh, that's one thing. Somebody asked me what we did. We did a lot of ambushes at night. Uh, the unit I was with, we did a lot of ambushes and they said, what do you do during the daytime? I said, we slept. You know, we could. We were tired. And, uh, yeah, on point, you don't, you pay attention to what's going on. I mean, watching for booby traps and hacking your way through brush and stuff. Not always the brush, but a lot of times the machete. And Did you come across some booby traps? Uh, I had some people set booby traps off behind me. And... Uh, the ones that followed where I went were okay, and uh, and I did see some booby traps, uh, some butterfly bombs that they put under, uh, oh gosh, rubber tree in the rubber tree plantations. They make little bowls that they drip that out in. They cut the rubber trees and they drip that raw rubber out in there, or raw yeah raw rubber, and you don't go step on them and. Uh, and I seen a couple of them that were actually cracked. And you walk over and look down there, and there's a, a butterfly bomb that they've turned upside down. So if you, so yeah, a few. And was, were there other types of booby traps as well? There were lots of them, but uh, what I seen was uh, claymores that they made, 
and they were somebody set those off i mean they weren't necessarily booby traps the ones that i seen and uh they made me a demo man for the company when i first got there so i was the guy that got to blow all that stuff up <laughs> um i mean i guess coming from experience um mail from home you know it's a real big it lifts your spirits can you tell us maybe something that you remember like a package or something that might have just helped you a little bit or lift your spirits or something like that oh they all of them help uh i, I don't remember anything specific and you know as far as letters it uh, i wrote to quite a few people and it sometimes became uh, almost burdensome i hate to say that but writing back trying to write because you didn't have time and you know sometimes wrote them at night and sometimes in the rain and everything trying to answer everybody back because they had their heart was in the right place, but uh, I don't think people really realize how uh, difficult sometimes it was to actually get them answered and get them in. And then, then the other thing is you kind of write a little differently for everybody. Like when you write your mom, it's really don't tell her what's going on. And <laughs> when you write this girl, you tell her this, and this one you don't tell it. You know, it's kind of a it's kind of different that way you have to think about who your audience is a little bit some of them you don't care you know it's kind of free, freelancing don't care. Um, but the packages were great I, I i mean i don't want to downplay that uh as far as anything specific i i don't i don't remember uh getting film i took a lot of slides and Getting film was really nice to have somebody send the film to you and the mailers, what they called mailers back in those days, and you filled them out, postage was free, stuck them in, somebody carried them to the choppers, I don't know how that worked. Uh, and then they went back to Palo Alto, California for development, and then they went home. I never ever seen a slide till I got home, because you had, I mean, we we lived in the jungle, we had no place to put them, you know, and so uh, you try to get a few rolls of slides ahead so you can stuff them in your rut sack but that's you had to uh, you had to be able to move with what you owned um I guess coming back to that um and I know you're in the infantry um so what was your like gear layout did you did you have were you super heavy or you know did you have like just bare minimum equipment it was pretty heavy uh yeah, I don't know what they weighed because I didn't have a scale, but it was pretty doggone heavy. We, we all of us carried fairly significantly more than our basic ammo load. Uh, carried more grenades than what our basic load was. Uh, and then, excuse me, at night, when you went out, you had claymore mines and fun stuff like that. And then later on, we actually got some starlight scopes, and the early starlight scopes were very heavy. And so you strap on a couple claymores and the starlight scope, plus your basic. It was pretty heavy. Light infantry, huh? It, a heavy infantry. <laughs> it, uh, it probably sometime approached 45 pounds would be my guess. I don't know, believe it or not. I mean, we, we always carried a major load of ammunition. And, with extra magazines, not just ammo, so it was all ready to go, and so and we had no restrictions on that. If you could pack it, take it, you know. And then, depending on where we went, uh, we a lot of times had uh, people carry extra ammo for the M60 machine gun, because those poor guys were all humped over, you know, carrying stuff, and you'd run a spool around your neck. And then, as I said, I was the uh, combat, or the explosives guy for the company so he always had c4 and debt cord and primers and all that stuff so D didn't do that at night didn't carry that at night but during the day he carried it and so it was pretty heavy i was in pretty good shape when i got back i bet <laughs> i bet <laughs>